Um, so I'm going to cover uh, both the efforts at Vanderbilt and then talk about um, the uh, emerging, <laughs> pun intended, I guess, efforts across uh, the eMERGE network to bring sequencing into pharmacogenetics prescribing. And uh, the one serves kind of in some ways as a, uh, a model using um, uh, a, a, a genotyping platform for what we're going to do in eMERGE. So I think this picture is, is, is a favorite at Vanderbilt um, that Dan has uh, uh, taught us all to use and probably familiar to many of you. Um, in 2000, uh, this was in the New Yorker, and, and uh, we like pointing out that, you know, just the complexity of, of handing, you know, a, uh, uh, your, your genetic sequence there to your pharmacist who looks a little bewildered amongst the many uh, medications there, and how do you actually translate this into practice? So, you know, we start with a lot of rich biomedical research. Um, I, you know, I think it's been increasingly important as we've talked through this meeting, and I think we all recognize the importance of information technology both on the research side and the clinical side. And then we're going to have to think about uh, new models of the healthcare system towards learning models of the healthcare system, as was talked about yesterday, as has been talked about today, and think about the healthcare system both in a discovery fashion and a closed loop, as we have many, many rare variants that we're going to find. And then, uh, then the system has to be able to adapt and change quickly. And I think that's another area that highlights the importance of uh, inf information technology as a driver for delivering um, uh, this uh, evidence. And so this is another, um, uh, another shot of the um, article last year in Nature um, uh, talking about where we're headed. And uh, I think that we see PREDICT and Emerge PGX sitting on this far end of the curve as moving it towards implementation and using that to actually drive uh, new discovery as well. Um, we've talked about the FDA list of uh, in integrating pharmacogenetic information into drug labels. And I just want to highlight that um, uh, there are 83 germline uh, medication, medications that have germline variants now listed in, in the FDA labels. Um, and uh, so, so and this number has been increasing. It was started in 2007. Um, when we looked at this in detail um, about a year and a half ago, we had 57 medications. And we took those 57 medications with germline variants and then looked at how many patients in a medical home population, meaning that they uh, get recurrent care in an outpatient clinic at Vanderbilt, would be exposed to one of those medications over five years. And we found that 65% of those medications would receive at least one of those medications in five years. And, um, you know, incidentally, one of those patients received 18 different medications um, in, in, in their time period at Vanderbilt. And uh, uh, about 15% received four medications or more um, during the time period. So, so we find that this is not an uncommon problem as we begin to have dense genotype information or sequence information available in the record. So why are both of these programs looking prospectively? Well, I think we all know that, that we, the most value to having this information is before the prescription event, if you can. Um, not only does it uh, lead to the right prescription the first time, but a lot of the adverse events are more commonly uh, occur um, near the initiation of the medication start. That's not true for all medications, clearly, but uh, the risk factors are greater um, a lot of times for many of them when you start. So this is uh, one of our screenshots for PREDICT. Um, PREDICT is a local effort um, that we've been working on for the last uh, two years. We started genotyping in September of 2010. Um, using the Lumina Admi chip, and our goal is primarily to prospectively identify um, patients and then genotype them on Admi platforms um, with embedded decision support in the clinical record. Uh, one of the uh, other components are reactive genotyping or just-in-time genotyping on certain patient populations in which it's easy to do so. When you know you're going to get a, a hip uh, a replacement, for instance, you have plenty of time to do the genotyping before they get warfarin. Um, and we also do it when they come into the cath lab. Uh, and uh, an important part of this is the workflow to actually get the clinical buy-in. And so we've talked a lot about this. We've uh, started, before we unveiled the test, talking to cardiologists. The first thing we went live with was clopidogrel, um, and doing work with the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee, and, and then convening, actually, a special subcommittee of the PNT Committee to work through these processes with us. And, uh, uh, and then a lot of um, focus groups after we unveiled um, the, uh, the program to, to talk to clinicians, get their reactions to not only things about whether they think genotyping is, is right or whether we should be doing it, but just 
how you physically or electronically implement this in the workflow to make, make it as smooth as possible, make them aware of what we're doing. So if we look at the um, a little over 10,000 patients we've genotyped so far um, and, and who has been genotyped why, um, if, if you say we have about 400,000 patients that have come through the system that have been unique, um, we have uh, about 90,000 uh, visits in our um, clinics that were targeted, mainly primary care, uh, cardiology, nephrology, and vascular surgery. Um, amongst those, 24,000 were flagged for prognostic testing. 5,000 of those people received the prognostic test. There's some, um, there's some time and implementation here, but um, you know, not everyone orders a test that's recommended as well. Some of that's just uh, workflow issues. And then about 5,000 have been tested for the reactive indication. So uh, initially we started testing in the cath lab and uh, joint replacements, things like that. So about a total of 10,000. Um, and then you can see the, the, um, the, the chances in which an advisor would fire. So about 22% of the people prescribed clopidogrel if they had genotyping would receive the revisor based on being a poor intermediate metabolizer. About a quarter of the simvastatin users. Warfarin fires in everyone, really, regardless of whether they have genotyping or not, because we use uh, clinical recommendations uh, if they don't have genetic information. And then rarely would you see with a thyropurine, and that's obviously a rare uh, medication that we don't try to predict uh, exposure for. So we talked about identifying people prospectively. We use an algorithm that uses demographics as well as clinical diagnoses to predict their exposure within the next three years of warfarin, clopidogrel, or simvastatin. Um, we trained it on a medical home population um, looking for uh, first exposure to that medication. And uh, this is actually generated just with easily available billing data and demographic data so that it would be uh, fast and easy to implement within different EHR systems. And in fact, all, uh, pretty much all the eMERGE sites have, are, have done something like this um, as they look forward to eMERGE PGX. So the model for what we do with genetic information, this has been alluded to in other discussions, is, is we get those 184 variants off the ADME platform. We know what variants don't work, and we drop them. And then we put uh, all of the variants that do work in, in a database, and uh, uh, only a select few of those for which we have validated that the results work. Uh, we have existing clinical decision support in the medical record, and of course it's been reviewed by a pharmacy and therapeutics committee. Only these enter the medical record. The rest sit in this repository, and as we implement new um, drug genome interaction uh, advisors, new decision support, validated uh, match, uh, surpasses level evidence, then it goes back into the EMR. So this is what it looks like, and this is, I realize, very small. This is a, uh, a patient. We have this section in this face sheet that says drug genome interactions, um, and uh, this patient has a, a variant for uh, warfarin, uh, simvastatin, and uh, thiopurines um, that would change their uh, risk. And the patient happens to be on warfarin and amiodarone, which is an, uh, affects warfarin dose. Um, they're also on simvastatin um, at a low dose, fortunately. And uh, they, don't, uh, they are not being prescribed uh, azathioprine or mercaptopurine at this point, but of course could later uh, develop that uh, exposure. So if you look at the current uh, 10,500 patients we've tested, 2.7% um, uh, are high risk for clopidogrel, the poor metabolizers. Another 21% um, uh, are intermediate metabolizers. Um, simvastatin ratio is a little bit higher, uh, a little about 28% are at some risk of uh, myopathy um, due to uh, one or two copies of SLC OMB1, SAR5. And then if you look at the four uh, drug genome interactions we have available now, and, and then look at the incidence of having variants um, in any of these, you know, it's, it's actually most of the population um, uh, is not normal when you start adding them all up. So it kind of goes to what we said before. When you look at multiple exposures, um, you, you get a greater chance to actually use the information, especially when it's already into your medical record. So about half have one variant, another quarter have two variants, and uh, we have a very small percentage of the people that actually have four variants. Only 17% have no variants. So this is what the decision support looks like for clopidogrel. If you try to order this, they have genetic information. It'll pop. I think. Yeah, uh, and uh, uh, it'll advise you to prescribe prasugrel. This is actually outdated. Um, uh, you could also uh, prescribe ticagrel as well. And uh, if you don't do that, it asks you why you're not following the advice. Uh, initially, we launched this for um, just poor metabolizers. About six months later, we uh, rolled it out for intermediate metabolizers as well, based on um, uh, changes in the evidence applications. And, um, and then we've uh, 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 
had to make adjustments based on whether or not we wanted to include, for instance, uh, doing a higher dose uh, clopidogrel as an alternative. The reason I suggest or mention those changes is just to emphasize the rapidity of which this sort of decision support seems to evolve compared to uh, dosing for uh, kidney failure, for instance. Th those, those recommendations seem to be, um, don't change as fast. These are our data um, amongst people prescribed, are attempted to be prescribed clopidogrel um, on a patient with genetic information. So, um, and uh, this, we on the x-axis, poor, intermediate, and then normal metabolizers. Um, you can see that the vast majority of normal metabolizers are good in clopidogrel in blue. Um, the poor metabolizers, actually about 60% of them get switched um, uh, in manual review. Um, and, uh, and then a dose um, a frequency of those who are intermediate metabolizers are getting switched to prasugrel. We're really not seeing much use of ticagrelor yet. I imagine that will increase over time. So um, uh, we can see it is making a difference in prescribing ha habits. Um, it is, uh, you know, not 100% here, but we haven't thrown out people here in these numbers who have had a stroke, who are over 75, you know, relative contraindications to using prasugrel. This is what a um, warfarin uh, advisor looks like. We, uh, with discussion with physicians, we do show the information used to calculate um, the dose recommendation. We tell them what the weekly dose recommendation is and a daily dose. Um, we have a, uh, a link here that tells them kind of how to break that up into terms of uh, number of tablets per day. Um, and we try to recommend a single tablet, a single dose every day. Um, as opposed to giving a, an off-the-bat a complex regimen to someone who's never started warfarin before. This doesn't fire for people that we know have, have received warfarin before. Um, looking at uh, one week of this, the first week, this was just launched at the end of last year, uh, 31 new inpatient starts. Seven of those 31 patients had been tested genetically uh, for another reason in the past. Um, two of them have a, had a difference. Um, what I really found interesting, remember I said that this fire is based on whether or not you have clinic, um, genetic information in the chart. Uh, only six of the 32 patients did the, did the prescriber actually give the sort of industry standard of five milligrams a day. So most people were using the guidance to, to, um, to, to tailor their therapy. Uh, they may not do exactly what it said, but they anchored one direction or the other based on it. This is one example of someone who didn't follow it. The, um, the system recommended nine milligrams. They were prescribed one milligram, um, really anchored complete opposite of what we recommended. And you can see in red their change of dose over time, in blue their change of INR. So um, eventually, about a month and a half later, they got to what we recommended at nine milligrams a day and reached the target INR. Um, so now we're talking about Emerge and Emerge PGX. So Emerge, uh, I think, is a, is a network familiar to, to many of you, and obviously many, many people in this room are from Emerge. Um, the nine sites or ten sites uh, uh, are listed here. The green ones are adult, the blue are, are children um, sites. And uh, you heard from John uh, just a minute ago. Uh, one of the goals of Emerge 2 is not just discovery, but actually implementing this into practice. So building, uh, integrating with an EHR, both uh, re results and other data um, and decision support. And so the, the goal of Emerge PGX is actually to use sequence data, embed it in the medical record, do uh, decision support around it. Um, it is a collaboration between PGRN uh, and Emerge. So the PGRN has developed the PGRN Seq platform, um, uh, which I believe has been talked about here before. Um, and and uh, uh, this is a, a platform, um, uh, well, I'll talk about it more in a, a second, I guess. But, um, and uh, a lot of other efforts of PGRN, such as CPIC guidelines we've talked about, um, Translational Pharmacogenomics Project, looking at putting data into practice, um, and then, of course, the platform being efforts of PGRN. Then Emerge, you know, having a, a expertise really about finding phenotypes in the medical record, a strong informatics component of how you integrate this stuff in the medical record, and then developing decision support. Um, I don't think I need to tell everyone here, uh, anyone here, about uh, the importance of rare variation, um, so I'll kind of skip this. These are the aims of uh, the Emerge PGX project. Aim one being to identify target patients for whom we think we can uh, make a difference in the future. Looking at um, important pharmacogenes, uh, actionable variants, using things like CPIC guidelines to inform actionable variants. 
and then uh, looking at putting those actionable variants that are, once they're validated and having validation methods, putting them into the chart with decision support around them, looking at outcomes around uh, performance metrics, process measures, uh, attitudes, um, and impact. And then aim three being a discovery aim. So we, we collect the sequence data. Um, we'll have a rich uh, EHR record on these patients. Can we start to use that to learn new things? Uh, the PGRN Seq platform covers 84 pharmacogenes. Uh, it was designed through the PGRN, 14 uh, uh, sites with multiple rounds of validating, um, has been well tested. Um, it is available to NimbleGen um, Custom Capture Array, um, includes these 84 genes in, in flanking regions, and uh, it can be ordered uh, beyond just the eMERGE PGX. And this is something I don't know as much about, so I would defer you to its creators, um, uh, Steve uh, Schur and Debbie Nickerson, um, to ask more about this if you're interested in uh, uh, being involved. It is one of the unique aspects is it does give very good capture of uh, those 84 genes. And this is the mean read depth for individual. You can see our axis here. We're looking at four to 600 here um, per individual uh, that was done. These are uh, hat map trios here. And then the mean rep read depth per gene um, across these genes. And I highlight genes of interest here. So um, we have a lot of reads um, uh, in multiple hundreds for really all these targeted genes that we're looking at uh, initially in eMERGE PGX. There are some challenges. Um, um, it is, uh, did very well compared to ADMI, um, uh, concurring on 88 of 95 um, samples on 150 sites. But problem areas, um, as with uh, 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 many of these platforms, would be 2D6 and HLA variants. Um, and this is nothing new to most of you. I keep coming in and out, don't I? Yeah, all right. You do have a lot of competition, so I don't know what's going on next year. Yeah, they're door. having a lot more fun next year. Yeah, they are. They are. Could they be having more fun? Maybe you step up your game a bit. Right, right. Okay, okay. <laughs> Food's coming, right? It's the, you know, it's all I can offer. Um, so, uh, uh, so, so look at the, these are the candidates that we have identified through eMERGE so far. Um, these are the primary ones, and some individual sites are doing some other things as well. Um, same things we're, we looked at to predict. Um, and uh, they all have CPIC guidelines behind them um, as well um, and uh, or, uh, perform well in PGR and Seq um, and have uh, easy orthogonal validation methods. We plan to total uh, genotype around uh, seven to 8,000 people across um, all of the eMERGE sites. Um, again, this is going to include both ch children and adults. Um, uh, and uh, you can see how the distribution across the sites uh, plays out. Uh, lo looking at this analogy of how we're going to store things and where we're going to put them um, after we sequence, there's going to be validation um, and uh, we're going to have uh, only putting the validated results into the EMR um, and uh, every eMERGE site is going through this sort of local buy-in process now of working with their equivalents of the pharmacy and therapeutics committees, working with providers to um, uh, get, figure out what they want to explore, um, how they would build decision support, integrate with the EHR, um, and what the workflow processes are for identifying these individuals and sequencing them. And um, of note, this is a consent study. We plan to go back and, and uh, survey uh, providers, patients, um, look at outcomes. The um, sequencing is, and validation are being done at different places and different models. Um, uh, several of the sites are doing their own genotyping, um, Mount Sinai, CHOP, uh, Geisinger, Mayo. Um, several of the sites are using uh, uh, UW and some are using CIDR. Um, and then different validation platforms, uh, ADME, TACMAN, uh, Sequinome, um, Sanger. Uh, uh, are so we have different ways of getting that, but really everybody's going to be going after um, the sequencing and validation efforts um, for the, the, the variants that they're depositing in the medical record. Everyone's kind of doing the, the three variants I talked about, or three drug genome interactions we talked about before, and I mentioned a few others like carbazepine, uh, thiopurines by some, um, and uh, some, uh, some uh, efforts around uh, 2D6 and codeine um, using local validation that will provide some evidence around um, the performance of PGR and Seq on that. Uh, everyone's looking at some sort of um, predictive evaluation um, or, or identification of patients so that we get sequence information um, and then uh, uh, called um, specific variants into their chart before hopefully they get exposure to these target medications. And then we can evaluate um, that exposure and what happened with prescribing. 
um, except for the pediatric sites, which are using more focused um, identifications. And uh, uh, this is, uh, initially we're gonna do some um, sequinome-based validation of at least these genotypes, and we're gonna do a few more as well, and there's some um, discussion about what those are gonna be. Probably uh, uh, 3A5 um, and tacrolimus will be included, um, and uh, uh, a few others like uh, CYP2C19, STAR17 may be included as well. Um, and then uh, integration with EHR being a key component of the stuff we do. Um, and a lot of the workflow that we have to work through uh, getting um, physician acceptance and, and uh, uh, involves this component. A lot of unanswered questions here at this point still about how we're going to actually put it in the data and in, data into the chart. Um, clearly, we have to do this in a structured way, uh, use, uh, uh, use paradigms and accepted like HL7 um, and uh, make them available for decision support um, using that. Um, and then build our advisors to use that electronic information. Um, we're working with standards groups. Uh, standards is always plural. There's all, many standards out there um, in informatics, and uh, uh, so, so we may use one and, and, uh, uh, and then borrow from some to come up with what will work best in our different EHR systems. It is important to note that we have a lot of different uh, systems represented. We have, um, uh, depending on how you want to count, a couple different homegrown systems. Um, many uh, sites use EPIC. Uh, GE uh, is used as well as uh, Cerner. So um, we're kind of, you know, the real world of, of, of working through EHR issues that are going to be applicable to many sites as they come off on uh, EHRs for meaningful use. Um, and hopefully that will help our data be more um, translatable to other sites. We, after we get our data, uh, we're going to have a lot of dense genotype data. We want to make that available to the community. We're going to have a, um, a kind of a variant server, um, what exactly this looks like or where it's going to be housed or kind of being worked out. Um, but uh, this, this variant server will have the sequence data, and then we want to combine it with some sort of phenotype database derived from the EHR. A lot of, uh, we're working at those details as well. Um, maybe integrate some um, uh, biological function data as well. Um, and have some sort of web interface to cure, query this that probably would involve different levels of um, uh, requests. Um, and uh, so, so in some cases, you know, maybe you have uh, access to just variants. Maybe some um, uh, levels of access would require you uh, aggregate counts, and then deeper levels would maybe give you, uh, with login, password, or maybe to emerge, would let you get at more and more information around specific uh, exposures. Um, so this phenotype database is very much in development. We're talking about what we can put into it. Um, developing these phenotypes is hard and, and it can take six months to 18 months. We did a, a, uh, we've done a couple pharmacogenetic phenotypes and they have been particularly hard um, to validate. And so um, looking at pharmacogenetic phenotypes that are in a curated fashion as we often do in eMERGE, um, may or may not be in the scope of what's initially in this um, phenotype database. Um, but we are going to feed it with a lot of data that we can get easily out of the EMR. And based on the current proposal is based on the counts of what we find in the chart, we may go after specific um, things that we can get at uh, more detail, like maybe INR with warfarin and trying to get at warfarin dose, for instance, um, if that tends to be a very common exposure that we get before the end of eMERGE uh, round two. Um, and uh, uh, so we're working through this. And this would be something that I think, you know, we could look at broader um, levels of uh, openness for um, uh, maybe just aggregate counts, like I said, um, not just to the eMERGE network. We have a number of process measures that each site's going to investigate. Um, I kind of alluded to this before, surveys, accrual measures, uh, performance of the PGR and seq uh, against other validation uh, uh, genotyping, which um, is obviously very important. Um, distri distributions of genotypes, um, and whether uh, uh, many of the sites have um, patient portals um, uh, that patients will be able to view this information, and so we'll be able to track whether patients look at their genetic information, how often they look at it. Um, and then, uh, of course, as I presented with PREDICT earlier, whether or not prescribers actually use the genetic information, whether it changes their care, um, will be uh, outcomes as well. And finally, we may look at rare variants and specific outcomes based on frequency of counts um, of, of those exposures and the variants. 
Um, so uh, a number of uh, potential for collaborations I mentioned earlier that PGR and Seek uh, platform is available for others to use as well. Um, and uh, we'd like to, um, as, as that happens, our, our plan is actually to make this variant server something that can be um, opened up. Um, so if other people sequence um, uh, uh, and, and want to re redeposit that data, I think we would um, want to build in that capability. Um, and then eventually this repository is going to be available as well. So um, with that, I will end before, wow, well, I just had one finger. So um, the, uh, 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 you know, yeah, right. okay finger, yeah. So um, I'd be happy to take any questions. <laughs> Great, I have to be careful because I'm on, I'm on camera. So. Um, so, uh, so Mark has a question, but before he does, are there other people? With, okay, so while you're thinking, go ahead, Mark. So going back to your very preliminary uh, predict data on warfarin, um, it, it was interesting to see how few, um, you know, uh, actually followed the sort of the standard recommendation. Um, and the the, the question Meaning, I had is, is did that, five milligrams a day sort yeah. of the default? Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. So one of the questions I had was that you know the, uh, some of us that have done some perspective looking at this really say if you're wild type the, the dose is really six that the five milligram recommended dose is based on the fact that we glommed all of the uh, uh, wild type and the variants together and kind of the, the based on the allele frequencies the number that spits out is five. Um, but uh, uh, have you noticed that people are uh, maybe aware of the fact that six may be closer in wild type and any correlation, or is it just too early to even know? I, I, I would say it's too early. The, uh, uh, I'll just hold it. Um, so, so I, uh, one of the things I think we've observed is when we eventually pushed out clopidogrel, a lot of people didn't really, it, it was unfamiliar, it was, um, uh, people had strong opinions, um, and uh, we had to sort of work through this idea of genome-guided care. And um, I, I really believe part of this is, is, is warfarin being the third intervention now that we've launched, and we've done all this, you know, sort of all these focus groups showing evidence and this sort of thing to finally come to a drug that everybody knows is highly variable. And, and they sort of work through this. I think they're sort of um, much more trusting of us now. Um, I don't know if that's, you know, I think that, yeah, exactly. That may, that may not always be a great thing, but, um, but I think they're starting to buy into the, uh, you know, drink the Kool-Aid, so to speak. Yeah, we've got to get away from that terminology. But anyway, um, <laughs> Pearl, you had a comment? Yeah, um, thanks so much. Um, you said that in the PREDICT model you asked people who did not follow your advice to write in why. Is there any, are there any major reasons why? Excellent question. I don't know the answer yet. We haven't looked yet. Other comments for Josh? Oh, uh, Wolfgang. And then Mike. Uh, just a quick question. There, there's a lot of new knowledge coming out, even on those standard tests in pharmacogenetics. So how flexible is the entire system when there's new knowledge out, and how, how do you respond to, to that on a system-wide basis? So, so um, I guess there's two components to that. One is the do we make a change decision, and then the second part is the informatics of actually changing the system. The, um, the first part, we're actually fairly, I think we're fairly conservative. Uh, we do require sort of this, this, this um, uh, level of evidence and a committee of other people reviewing it um, to sort of say, okay, we want to do this. Um, and we certainly have high standards about replication with the ADME chip um, and performance. Uh, if, those, uh, uh, if those are passed, we can actually generally implement changes pretty quickly. Um, and uh, so overall, we've had five different iterations of the clopidogrel advisor in the last uh, two years. Um, and that, that probably is definitely above average for our decision support. Um, and we've launched, uh, I guess, a couple different, uh, uh, we've made minor tweaks to the warfarin since it was launched too. Great. Mike? So I'm, I'm curious about how, uh, how you're interacting with the infrastructure that ultimately supports this nationally. The, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a, you, you obviously know the rare variant problem, um, which doesn't just apply to pharmacogenetics. It's throughout the genome, and it's going to take data from far and wide. Um, but genetics is so low on the radar screen of most of the, uh, 
standards organizations and, and hospitals because it's not a big financial blip on the radar screen uh, that we're having to develop our own. So as you roll these out for, or standardize your data dictionaries around these pharmacogenetic diagnosis evaluation and uh, sort of analytical uh, dictionaries, do you take them through the standards panels so they start to build the national infrastructure that allows this to happen in an EMR environment or is this restricted to your studies? You, you said eight to 18 months, my experience has been you can get your data <laughs> Uh, dictionary standardized in 18 months and then it's another 18 months to work through the standardization organizations that make it national policy that EPIC and others have to integrate into their systems. That was a great point. So um, the 88, that sort of time frame was just talking about finding a phenotype. I didn't talk about sort of, that wasn't the sort of standards process, um, which is a whole other process. Um, so, so we do have an EHR integration work group, um, which uh, Irwin is one of the co-leaders of, um, and uh, uh, we are we are interacting with those national bodies um, and uh, have had them on phone calls and and sort of uh, sharing what we're doing. Um, at our local effort, I, I would say that um, we have not quite been doing as much of that, just trying to figure out all the workflow pieces. You know, it's kind of like in uh, principle of informatics, as you you know, think about the, the, the process and do it on paper first, you know. And that's sort of, you know, before we try to figure out what we're going to standardize, we were just trying to work through the kinks and, and get it through the system and see where the pressure points are. Um, but we have uh, uh, just like, uh, you know, uh, we have sort of uh, extracted models kind of like what St. Jude has done and others where you, where you can start to break up these problems into things that are reproducible and structurable, structurable formats. Great and job. trying to publish on it, et cetera. Okay, I think our last, last comment, Jonas. So in, Emerge has a very visible presence in the standards landscape, but it doesn't have an equivalent presence in the interoperability landscape. So if I look for, say, an HTTP API, just to be a little bit technical, this will be recorded, so maybe someone in your team will be able to react on this. It's, it's just nowhere to be seen. And my question is, mm -hmm. is this intentional? Is this something you, you don't want to initiate now? Or, or it's just uh, maybe lack of uh, oversight over this particular issue of interoperability. Um, so Erwin, do you want to talk about? I'm just kidding. The uh, uh, so 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 it's not something that we're intentionally trying to avoid. Um, we certainly are, are talking with uh, you know Epic and Cerner, and you know we have uh, GE. We, we, we've we've invited them in. We we are certainly talking with them and having those discussions. You know we have a, a homegrown EMR ourselves. Um, so uh, some of the sort of standard, the, the sort of API integration with commercial EMR just questions are maybe a little bit harder for us to direct head, address head on. But certainly we want to, and we want to no, get I at mean, some of those problems. I mean interoperability with academic yeah. platforms, not not commercial. But there is lack of interoperability with academic platforms. Definitely, you're right on that too. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I mean th this is a huge issue, yeah. um, uh, and and when it really comes right down to it, all of us that are implementing. Are, are you know representing the pharmacogenomic gen data as uh, individually developed data elements because we don't have any standard for how to represent genomic data in the EHR. So I mean we're, we are so far behind on some of these fundamental needs that to actually proceed with implementation we're essentially having to say we can't solve this problem, we have no control over this problem, therefore we will ignore this problem and come up with local solutions. So in this particular situation, we really are, when you've seen one implementation, you've seen one implementation, at least at the, uh, the, code, uh, uh, the code level, even though we're, we're on the same page in terms of the narrative and the algorithms and those sorts of things. Yeah, I guess you could say the standard is a PDF document, right? Great. All right, Josh, thank you. Uh, so, Rex, if you can head on up there. Oh, okay. um, is that, was there something else? Well, yeah, but so, so uh, okay, so I should explain. Um, so, <laughs> so sorry. Um, so Rex actually was, was going to talk a little bit about what our plans were for the next meeting, because we were thinking of having Jeff explain the next meeting, but we're going to probably make that the next, next meeting. And, and Rex will make this all very clear <laughs> when he talks, because I obviously didn't. So Rex. <laughs> um, but, Maybe we could have the other yeah. slide. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but Richard, if you could give us the Archism slide. 